Okay, so let me start this uh, lecture, which is actually a sort of opening lectures from a series which is focused to uh, one of the very important subjects, as you know, Renka and I are, are working in it, and that is the remote sensing applications in archaeology. So the first lecturer today is Professor uh, Rodek Ronchkowski of the Poznań Adam Mickiewicz University of Poznań, one of the most important universities in Poland, and one of the most important archaeological institutions in Poland, to, to be honest. Uh, so um, uh, that's, uh, he, he's actually based in, in Poznań University since almost at the time he, he finished his PhD and so on and so on. So he, he is a permanent uh, uh, member of the, of the department. And um, we actually met for the first time something like in 1995 or something like that on a conference of the European Association of Archaeologists which was then held in Riga, I remember it was in Riga, in, uh, in uh, Latvia. And uh, then we actually met in a session which Rodek organized at the time on archaeological remote sensing applications. And since that time, we keep uh, very, very, very close connections, friendship, and so on and so on. So uh, I am very pleased that he is the first of those who were invited and who actually accepted our invitation to, to, to lecture here. So he, there were just two persons at the beginning in, uh, in, in Poland in the 1990s who opened, started to open the project of aerial archaeology. Rodek was one of them. The other one was uh, Professor Zbigniew Kobelinski, who will be the third, probably, if we will have money <laughs> on, on, on the next, uh, next academic year, will be, uh, will be uh, the third uh, person to speak about uh, remote sending archaeology in their countries. And so that uh, next one will be in two weeks, as you probably know, after uh, in two weeks there will be Professor Zoltan Chajlik from the uh, in the Budapest, also another keen, keen uh, person, uh, personality in the archaeology in, 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 in Hungary in that case. And Rodek is, uh, apart from being uh, very much involved in this subject in archaeology and remote sensing applications, he's also uh, one of very few aerial archaeologists, I would say, who is very much theoretically based. He, his his, his uh, theoretical works are famous, I would say. And he, uh, so that's, 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 that's a very important topic from his side, actually. His habilitation work, which he published as, as, a, as a monograph in Polish, was just about theory and theory rather than methods in uh, the application in, in, in remote sensing. So that's, 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 uh, that he also, I shouldn't forget, that uh, Brodek was for about five years uh, chairman of uh, what is called three years only. Well, it's obligatory, it's three years. years. Yeah. Yeah. No, no more. No more. <laughs> uh, chairman of the of what is called Air Archaeology Research Group, which is a non governmental uh, organization, international organization for people involved, either uh, professionals and amateur involved in in subject in the subject of uh, remote sensing in archaeology. So. Rodek, you will have now, uh, now uh, the possibility uh, to, to say something about your theoretical and, and these, these opinions about how far actually we are able and we can apply methods and the ways which, which we use which we <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for invitation, for inviting me for, for the lecture and for two lectures, let's say. Uh, I am not just a traditional archeologist, so please forgive me if sometimes I got the comments which you might not like very much. <laughs> uh, my general interest at this moment is uh, to think about the role of technology in archeology. span and the remote sensing is just a case study. So we are in facing with the sort of revolution, technological revolution in archaeology, and sometimes we believe that it's just now we will get past the knowledge about the past. I'm a bit skeptic about it, so this lecture will be 
about my skepticism and why the skepticism uh, is, exists or is. Okay, I'm, I'm useless in lecturing and I much more prefer discussion. So I would be very happy if you can interrupt my lecture anytime if you want, if you agree or disagree or you can't follow my ideas and so on, so please interrupt me and I will ask you some questions as well. So please be responsive and answer the question and not like normal students, quiet, okay? <coughs> so, uh, so shall we start? Okay. Okay, good, good reaction and good beginning, yeah? Okay, any comments? <laughs> very untraditional. <laughs> very untraditional. Okay, good. Uh, any idea why I put the first slide like this? To start a discussion. To start a discussion about? Everything like this. Okay. I so think we are the remake about this car. <laughs> I thought about, about the cats, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. The the left one is maybe surprising. The right one it's uh, okay. Just a nice photograph of the nature, right? Uh, okay. No more at this moment. <laughs> this kind of photograph. But the question is why? What? What did you notice in those photographs? And what those three photographs uh, um, suggested to you? They were taken by me, so, okay. Any ideas? Uh, little pigs are very cute, and also are very good for, for food. <laughs> okay, I am not a vegetarian, but, <laughs> okay. Okay. I would say that they are prefer for first of all probably why you you, you, you actually show what these photographs are that they for anyone can be at least attractive, maybe very attractive in in connection with the lecture which you which you are probably expecting to think about in here. Nice pictures and and some somehow, you know, attractive because they, they are unusual more or less and so on. Are you taking this kind of photographs? in your day life? Maybe your first one, that was kind of funny. It's just <laughs> funny, yeah, 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 just funny, but the purpose is that I took, okay, just to, to remember the situation, yeah, and to show to someone, yeah, look how the situation is in Athens, yeah, that c cats are sitting and resting on car, okay, or pigs are, in somewhere in the world uh, on the market, yeah? Uh, it is just a, to inform people that I met the situation like that, yeah? And you do it the same when you go for holidays or when you use Facebook uh, and different stuff like that, social media, you put the photograph of the breakfast or the lunch or when you meet people somewhere, a strange situation, you take a photo, yeah? And put on the social media. Okay, so why? Why photography? Why photography is so important? Why photography is, let's say, in everyday life use now, okay? Because the visual aspect is really important for yeah, yeah, okay. It's actually more believable you know, because you actually have the physical evidence for it, you have the picture. If I just say, you know, for example, you don't know me, so if I say something to you, well, you will be, yeah. are you sure about yeah. that? But if I show you the photo, then. Yeah, and it is the photograph is used just to prove 
to prove that something happened, right? Also, people don't like, don't like reading text. Right, and it's much, much easier, <coughs> yes, and yes, and uh, let's say there are no doubts, yeah? Of course, when we look at the photographs of the news, we might be very suspicious how they were selected, what, what purpose, and so on. So we start to think slightly differently about the photograph, but let's start from the very beginning. The photograph, let's say, appeared in the mid of 19th century, and then it was a real change in the culture. The painters started to understand that they don't need to present the real world, uh, world uh, when they paint. Okay, on the left side we got a painting, fantastic painting, yeah, and it, it was an art. And then since then they started, okay, now we can create paintings including our emotions, our perception of the world, we don't need to present the world as it is, because it was taken by photography, right? So people who were involved in using photography, applying photography, photographers and both philosophers or thinkers about photography, they, they started to build a sort of understanding what is the role of photography. Okay, you, I, I guess you can read this quotation, okay, and it, uh, what is very important here, that photography is objective, okay, it is 1925, okay, let's read another one, it is from 62, so it's relatively modern thinking. Photography is the only language understood in all parts of the world, okay? So it means, it means that if we present the photography uh, to people in China, to people in Australia, or Eskimos, or people wherever in the world, they will see at the photograph the same, right? Is it this understanding? But I can see that colleague is... Uh, it's not, full, not fully agree. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, so following this understanding of photography, we can tell that we can trust what we can see. Okay, now we already know that not, not fully. And camera does not lie, right? Okay, no, more and more <laughs> okay. heads. <laughs> No. Okay. Yeah, but in the general public, when we ask people on the street, do they trust photography? They will answer yes, right? And they, when they go for holidays and send the message to their friends with photograph with the Eiffel Tower or so, yes, they were there. So it is a proof. And when photography was, let's say, introduced, discovered, in, in, uh, and applied in culture, it is exactly the same time when many, many sciences or disciplines, scientific disciplines developed. Archaeology as a science, as a scientific discipline, developed in mid of 19th century. So the same time when photography appeared, right? So this understanding of photography was automatically introduced to archaeology as well. So when we got an image like this of artifacts, so it is a proof that they, those artifacts were looked like there as at the photograph, and they were discovered, let's say, and they were used. So it is true, it is objective true that photographs. Are. And why we use photographs in, during during the excavations or any other uh, research activities, investigations. Okay, Lenka is teaching you that you have to use photographs, yes, and some steps more, to take photographs of, let's say, archaeological features, archaeological strata, ar archaeological objects, and so on, yeah? Why? Well, I mean, to, to represent it quickly and in, a, in an understanding way, 
and to prove that it was there, yeah? To prove that it was where. So the basic thinking about the role of photography in documentation, archaeological documentation, is objective true, right? Even if we think about it or agree or disagree, it is a, let's say, deep root of thinking about photography. Okay? Is it true? It depends what is true. <laughs> it depends what is true, yeah. It's just partly true, I would say. It's <laughs> possible, you know. It's possible, partly true. Yes, it's true, it's true. Yeah. If you take the camera this way and this <laughs> Okay, so no, definitely this tower should not stand like that, yeah? Because, okay. We will return to, to this place. Okay, so photographs in archaeology, uh, let's say what I mentioned that all sciences from 19th century assumed no, no cultural neutrality of photography. Yeah? That photographs is culturally neutral. Uh, and it, it relates to positivistic thinking about uh, about doing research and getting knowledge about the past. But in 1995, uh, two, two guys, Jenks and Slater, wrote that reali reality at the photograph is reduced to visible. Okay, so we got only one part of the world yeah, at the photograph. Uh, and it is uh, mm, it depends on what the photographer wo uh, wanted us to, to present. Okay? So we are now in the problem which was discussed already in Greek philosophy. And Greek philosophers created this kind of concept of mimesis which is that the proper realistic image means that it is the same as reality, okay? So if we got a very, very good image of something, so it means that this thing, we can treat it as real reality, okay? So, Lenka, sorry, I will, <laughs> I will return to your teaching. You mentioned 3D modeling, yeah, using photographs. Okay, so now we can think that just individual photographs is not enough. So we need to take more photographs to create 3D model, yeah. Okay, and then if we create 3D model, we will have a real object and we can study this real object, right? It is objective thinking. It is. Okay, and it is a problem not only archaeology, it is in all uh, disciplines, scientific disciplines, which use photographs as a tool, yeah? Or models as a tool. So, uh, accepting this kind of approach, which for many, many people it is, uh, it is obvious, there is a just straight connection between reality or past reality and the knowledge about this reality, okay? And nothing is involved. And it is just going back even further to uh, 18th century. It is exactly what was mentioned by David Hume. It is empiricism. That through observation, through the experience, we can get a knowledge about the, the world, the, about the reality. So the photograph, it is just getting knowledge about the reality, including past reality. In 60s and 70s, something changed uh, in uh, philosophy, and it is called something like linguistic term, and it questioned many, many aspects of, many aspects of thinking about the world, including objectivity of photography. 
And it was what started me to, to, to be interested in photography, okay? And it was one of them who discussed, really discussed the role of photography in culture was Roland Barthes, a French philosopher, photographer, also worked with photographs and thinkers. And one of his uh, very influential book was Camera Lucita. The reflections of photography, it was completely different and changed the perspective of looking at the photograph. That from, the very, from this point of view, from the after linguistic turn, photography started to be a text. Text should be read, right? And now we, I can ask the question, is that everyone reads the text in the same way and understand the text in the same way? Definitely not. We know it already from many, many years, or so centuries even. For those who studied Bible, they understood that both translations and reading the Bible might be different, and it is hermeneutic. From the very beginning, it was called hermeneutic, hermeneutic of Bible, and now we can expand it on the hermeneutic of text, and if we treat photographs as, as text, so it might be a hermeneutic of photograph. So immediately, this previous slide looks differently because we got at least two actors or agents involved in this process. So someone who takes a photograph uh, and someone who works with these photographs, uh, let's say, who interprets the photographs. And then, through this whole process, we may get some knowledge. But it is different knowledge. Yeah? It's not the same knowledge, the same character of the knowledge when we believe that there is no agents involved in this process. So if, we, if I ask now, uh, is it correct this Greek philosopher's concept that realistic image, it means reality. Is it correct or is it acceptable or not? What is the answer? I would say it depends on the situation. Yeah. If you take a photo of, for example, a church, mm -hmm. uh, the colors will be a bit different, uh, the perspective will be a bit different, but we can agree that it is that church we are talking about, and that's it. But that's the, you know, um, yeah, the, it depends on the point of view. And I will say that there are images that everyone interprets differently. OK. So the photographer might got an idea what is important and, let's say, expose it, yeah? And the other person who is looking at the photograph is looking for something different, yeah? So everyone, if I, the, we will do some experiments, yeah, here. Uh, uh, if I give you some photographs, everyone will see something different than the photograph, right? So if we treat photographs as a realistic image, it should be true that it is the same as reality, but Based on what we just discussed, the answer is not, right? So this, this Greek philosopher's concept, according to our knowledge and understanding the world, is not acceptable anymore. So looking at the, uh, <clears throat> the whole process between the reality and let's say photograph, even photograph, as a representation of the, the, the world, there are some many aspects, like language, culture, experience, text, image, author, recipient, spectator. Spectator is just the person who is looking at, right? So very, very complex problems between, create, uh, between the reality and, some, and creating representation, yeah? I am not talking about interpretation of the representation, which is even further, right? So it was a 
another thinker and photographer who presented this kind of thinking about the photography and I highlighted in red, let's say the most important element that photography is a system of visual editing. Okay, so we got the impact. Photographer got an impact on the creation of the image. Yeah, and there are a number, a number of possible, let's say, ways of taking photographs of the same features, the same objects. So every student can take different photographs of the same object. Yeah. And, uh, and strata. Okay, we will return to, to this uh, quotation later on with some changes, but the, my question is, would you agree with it according to what we already discussed? Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes, okay. I would say, the problem is now that we are in the digital, digital world, which we will can move manipulate it. the photographs yes. very much and so on and so on. But if we take only the taking the picture without not even, I mean, using uh, the, 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 the possibilities of the, of the camera software and so on and so on, just, just make a few photographs. So obviously, and let's come to, to aerial photographs from archaeology, from rock art, for instance, and so on. Obviously, you can see the reality on the surface of the field Always different if you if you photograph it in the midday, in, in, in the sunset, the same feature you can see as different almost way. like almost like three three-dimensional photograph done by photographic, although it's not true, it's but because of the shadows and so on. So what I would maybe argue is that yes, everybody can take different angle, different height, and so on and so on, and different uh, climate conditions, different uh, uh, Light conditions and so on and so, but in so I would say it is almost reality in that moment in that and so it, it shows reality in the sunset and I don't know you know what I mean and in this angle so so obviously objective reality is something which 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 is not but almost it is a reality taken from one point of view or you know what I mean. Okay. Yes. So Martin answers the question. Yes. Okay. Not, not my question, so we disagree. But don't worry, we can drink beer together. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah? Uh, do you mind if I take off this because it's very hot here? Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay. So now we are back to the uh, tower in Pisa. Thanks to these ladies, this tower is still standing. Yeah? <laughs> okay? She really supports it. And uh, even if she is at home now, yeah, she can present to her friends that, look, I really work hard to protect the, this Pisa tower. Okay? Or maybe it is like this. Yeah? Okay? There is no problem at all. Yeah? And there is no reason to visit this place, yeah? Mm -hmm. Definitely not to support it. Okay, oh, we, it's our friend, our friend uh, from uh, English, English Heritage, yeah? English Heritage, yeah? Okay. Matthew, okay, yeah? It's a very strong man, yeah? Okay? It is just a photograph, yeah? During one of the conference and conference trip, uh, we took this kind of photographs, just illusion, yeah? Just illusion. Okay, and you know illusion probably very well. So just now experiment how well you can interpret aerial photographs, what you can see at aerial photographs, okay? Just a few words quickly, not a proper interpretation. Anything? Any ideas? That could be... Mm reminds of the Rome Villa, Romans, 
Excellent. Some pose and holes. We would need to fix characters. Back to the stores or something. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nothing? Unfinished field work. <laughs> <laughs> Unfinished field work. Okay. Stipes. Okay. Land power, let's say. It will kill me. It will kill me. Yeah? Okay? Any idea? Boroughs. Barrow mounts, yeah? Okay. Former barrow mounts. Former, yeah, yeah. It's completely level, but okay. Due to, let's say, some stone structures around, it could be like this. Okay. So, okay. It, it, it was a great experience. Okay, I will. I have to go back. So I will tell you. I would be g happy if it is a Roman villa, yeah. <laughs> but probably it is no. It's 19th century house, oh. yeah. Buildings, yeah. Building with concrete uh, fundaments, something like this. Okay. It would be first Roman villa in Poland, yeah. <laughs> Unfortu unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, not. Okay, it is uh, those white dots. It is just a uh, dry hay, yeah. yeah, dry hay. But but we do have archaeology here, which is not visible or faintly visible, which is okay. I can use this stuff. Okay, with this here, there, there is an earthworks. There is an earthworks here, yeah, and here. But it is so faintly visible in, in, uh, in relief, in topography. And this photograph is taken without shadow, right? Because we can see that the shadow is very, very short one. So the shadow does not show it, okay? Okay, you are like Polish students, yeah? Okay, it's exactly similar to similar, so it is a kind of culture you need to. Okay, this stuff is very interesting because it, this photograph was uh, maybe not the concrete, uh, this one, because it, I took this one. But this uh, feature was presented to me by my PhD student asking what it might be, or is it something visible there? And my answer was as yours, more or less, nothing. Nothing important, maybe some farming practices, yeah? And he told me, but it is a place of the First World War uh, camp for soldiers, yeah? And the barracks here, right? So, and now I can see it easily, and I guess you can see it as well, yeah? But it is a matter of knowledge, yeah? That it is important when we look at photographs. And here, unfortunately, there are no barrows. Yeah, but there is a, um, traces of animals, of, I don't know, deers, let's say deers. Dur during the season, uh, later season, they start to create couples, yeah? So the, the, the male is following female, female is escaping, but not very much escaping. So they tre create this kind of features, yeah? So it, it is perfect archeology, span yeah? Okay, so now after this short class of, of interpretation of area photographs, it is a part of, of the photograph, yeah? So we got only part of the photograph or other part is covered. So can you see an archaeology here? Yes or no? Uh, yeah? There seem to be some, some dark markings, but what would it be? These uh, yeah, it's, it's cultivation. It's, it's, it's related to the cultivation, yeah? Okay. Yeah, nothing more? Any other volunteer? Uh, yeah. it's, it's a power, yeah, no, it's a power. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so, so, there so is some yeah. Kind of dart, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, probably processing of photograph, some mistaken processing yeah, of photograph. Just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Like lighter. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you you know this photograph, so <laughs> I can't know. <laughs> no, 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 I can maybe so see something okay. over here, okay. and Clark has this over here, also. And this is not part of the ceramic. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, we will return to it, okay? <laughs> okay, so why we can see what we see, okay? Or why we can't see, so because we experienced some photographs that you saw something different and I presented and then you started to believe me, yeah? You, you, you believed me, yeah? So you accepted my interpretation, yeah? And the question is why? Why did you accept my interpretation of the previous photographs? It is a point, yeah? So let's go to Polish microbiologists and thinkers and let's say to some way philosophers who in certes work on the um, cognition and facts let's say in certes it was just a positivistic approach to to any sciences and there were facts yeah if we if we could identify the the virus or bacteria or so it was a fact, right? It was treated like a fact. And he thought, and he developed this critical reflection of this way of thinking. And he, what is the most important here, it is this, this quotation. In order to see one, one has to first to know, yeah? So first we, has, we need to have a knowledge and then we can see it, right? So when I gave you some knowledge about what could be at the photographs, then you accept it because it's more or less rational, acceptable, and so on, yeah? And you agreed with me, and now, uh, and, uh, and you got a knowledge, yeah? I passed some, transferred some knowledge from me to you, and you then started to see something at photographs, right? And uh, Ludwig Fleck also proposed some other categories of doing something, something uh, in the field which we can call sociology of knowledge. Uh, that the concept of thought style, that there is something that the group of scientists, researchers, they create a sort of way of thinking and then if they cooperate, they share this styles of thinking. And also sort of collectives that we got a group of people who are dealing with the same way, thinking in a very similar way, so they can understand each other. And someone who is presenting different approach is outside, is marginalized. In uh, uh, Leszek Kowakowski wrote an essay about the, let's say, philosophical uh, essay uh, about the legend of uh, Kennedy. And the consequence of presenting different approaches was much more dramatic in this essay because there were competition of three researchers and the, um, the board voted whose interpretation is correct, and there's one who was correct, it was awarded, and two others were killed, okay? It is a metaphoric way. If you present something different, 
in the field of doing research. It is far, far from just collect, uh, thought, collective thoughts, yeah? You are relegated from the group of being researchers, yeah? Because let's say you can do MA or you can do B PhD, okay? Because no one can accept it. And you are, you are not scientists anymore, yeah? Or researchers anymore. So it is culture, yeah? Cultural activities, way of think, uh, way of uh, being within the society, scientific society, that we have to think. When the process of teaching is just bringing young people into thought collectives, right? Because we teach what we understand, how the world should, how the research should be done to be correct, right? Again, I will return to, to Lenka. Sorry, Lenka. <laughs> My name. <laughs> <laughs> then let's say that you want to do study on some objects of future and so on, and you will not do a 3D model because you can argue, find out arguments that it's useless and it will not help you in your research. So you will not pass it. But I will appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> if, they, if they got arguments, exactly. okay, if someone got an argument why I don't want to do it, okay, why it is useless for my task, okay, it's fine. If it is just because of laziness, it's a different story, right? So can you ask something? What is the difference between what this, 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 and what you are trying now to, to explain? It, it, it reminds me very much the Kuhn's paradigms uh, concept. Yes, Kuhn's, Kuhn's uh, later on, much later, uh, uh, Kuhn, yeah, uh, um, referenced to reference to Fleck. But Kuhn is well known. Okay, but Fleck, we, who did it, let's say, 30 or 40 years earlier, is not known. Yes, but uh, also listening to what you say, there, yeah. is, there, is, there, there, there would be a difference which I would see. The first, the, this one, this person, and you interpret it as that it is, you are either going with us or you are outsider. Yeah. But with Kuhn's paradigms, it wasn't like this in, in science. It yeah. They just said, well, there is. A, there is a mainstream, there is a mainstream, yeah, and, yeah. and still there are some, yeah. some continuous uh, okay. high streams, you know, and suddenly they, they, they just reopen. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's, let's say, maybe it is my interpretation of it, just to, let's say, enhance this, the idea, uh, but maybe the Thomas Kuhn concept, it's based on it, or uh, reference to, to this concept, yeah, is, uh, and it was just applying to concept of paradigms in, this, in, in, in science. It is not a concept of paradigms, yeah? It is general concept of, let's say, group of uh, people, researchers and so on, working together and cooperating, exchanging ideas and so on, yeah? Not just a trends like a, a, a paradigms uh, presented by Kuhn. Yeah, but it's it's not it's not a contradiction, definitely. Okay, so let's return to this stuff. Still nothing. Still no more ideas. Mm -mm. Ah, now you can see. So now you can see, you can see where the, this archaeological feature is. Yes? Yes? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. So it means that if we got another aspect, it is another aspect when we can seek the context, wider context, we can understand. Or we create something, our m mind creates something which is missing. Yeah? So now, even if it is very, very, very faint, our mind created it and now we can see it. Yeah? Okay? Okay? Yes, so I did not lie. Okay. Oh. Okay, come on. Sorry. Okay. And it is it is also the problem which is which was which appeared uh, in philosophy 
also, all, uh, also during the between the world wars by Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, so-called late uh, Wittgenstein, who presented this kind of image or discussed this kind of image, we can see either the duck or rabbit, but we can't see together, right? So it is something which is called the just true illusion, and it is discussed in philosophy. How much culture influences our thinking and our perception, visual perception, yeah? What is very important in positivistic science is positivistic approach, visual perception is crucial to understand the world, yeah? We much less use uh, ears, taste, smell, touching something, but eyes, we use eyes as a basic way of understanding the world. So if there are something like that, that we see culture, so it means that the building knowledge is sort of illusion, right? And you can find out in the internet plenty of images like this, uh, that you can see either or, right? Okay, what you can see? Let's go home, yeah? <laughs> it's enough for today, yeah? Okay, let's go home. Can we? Lenka, Martin, can we go home? I, I Not think why you were looking forward, I definitely have to recommend to you to visit an excellent museum in Prague, Museum of Illusions. Oh, yeah. 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 My, 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 my grand case recently, yeah. and they were absolutely divided. Yeah, so you should go for the visit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now let's say go to the much more serious stuff, okay? Now we are working in the world and everything is digital, right? Everything is digital, including photography is digital, yeah? So if we understand, at least if I understand, digital photography is just a set of numbers, right? They say so. <laughs> at least, yes, yes. Uh, it's only what I can do, just, just trust. Only what I can do is just trust, yes, yes, that numbers. Can we understand what is here as a set of numbers? No, okay? So we don't know what is this representation. Yes, numbers represent something, and, but we don't know what represent. So, okay, again, back to Ludwig Fleck, that it's that uh, he, let's say, discussed the problems of technical terms and scientific device, that when we use computers and when we use total station or when we use camera or sensors or something like this, we started to depend on these tools. Yeah? We start to think through those tools. We think about the world and what we can do through the options those tools can give us, right? So it is another aspect that to some extent technology starts to govern our activities. It's not just our questions, but technology starts to influence our thinking about the world. And it is not far away from Heidegger when a uh, uh, he discussed the technology and one of his point is that technology uh, provides us to stop thinking. Yeah? We start to in, in, accept and use technology without thinking. So we just follow the step by step what is necessary to do and we and we sometimes don't think why we use this technology. In, in Polish system, I don't know if it is in Czech system as well, when people apply for grants in archeology, span international grants, they have to include technology now because it is fashionable and it shows that it is very, very modern, yeah? And if reviewers, or the the, those who are preparing proposals, they don't think what for, 
quite frequently. This technology is just, I don't know what, what for this technology, but it must be mentioned because new technology should be included. Yeah? I don't know. I don't know why. Okay. And it is also the division between discovery versus discovery. <laughs> okay. What we used to do, let's say using aerial photographs quite frequently, is just taking photograph of pretty archaeological feature, yeah? Object settlement or graves or whatever, rondel, yeah? And quite frequently, this discovery is limited to the taking, okay, it is here, and it is this, that's all. Okay, and something like this is put into the database. Yeah, we got a settlement with sunken houses here. Yeah, and there is a point of polygon showing where is it. Sometimes there is a chronology if it is possible to to define the chronology. That's all. Yeah, for Heidegger, it is not a discovery. Discovery is much more. It's much more critical thinking about the, what we can see what it could be, why it is like this, and why it might be different tomorrow, right? So this, when we look at the world which is around us, in news, which it is what makes me furious, in Polish news, this discovery is understood just here. Oh, archaeologists discovered something. So it means, and there is no information about it, yeah? And our archaeologists are just happy. Oh, look, I discovered, yeah? I am a famous archaeologist because I discovered something, yeah? And nothing more, yeah? So it is this kind of understanding of discovery, not this aspect which was, let's say, proposed by Heidegger. So now we can go back to why these numbers. Okay, we got, let's say, different sorts of sensors, digital data, and we can understand, and try understand the data, what was recorded through variety of visualizations. So the visualization is the, this stage of processing the data that we can start to think about the feature which is a subject of our research. Right? Is it correct? Oh, thank you. Okay, so if we start to think about visualizations, so if we work with visualizations, in fact, we work mostly with, with visualization, so what is the relation between visualization and virtual reality? Is this problem or it's not a problem? Should I ask this question or not? Well, well, depending on how you define the reality, you know, because... Virtual reality. Yeah, because virtual. if you, again, take it, like, 100% real, then definitely not. Definitely I not, that yes. We can all agree on that. Okay. Thing. Of course... But it's nice visual... It's the visualizations are a nice visualization of the reality. It can, you know, show you how it might look, but it's still... It won't just be one hundred percent. Yeah, but it will be proof. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but my way of thinking is that okay, if we are talking about visualization, not about analog photography anymore, yeah, just visualization. So why not to think about the virtual virtual reality? Because when we create visualizations, we can process the data in variety of ways, yeah? We can apply filters, different algorithms, and so on, so on, so on, so on. So final product is far away from reality, I would say. So maybe it is worth to start about the uh, reality. So let's first try to define visualization. So it is a sort of image, right? which is a vision of the object, landscape or so. The image is created by using modern technologies, yeah? 
and might cons consist something which is, which we believe is real, because I don't know what is real, in fact, okay, as well as fictional, yeah? And it is, it allows to treat them as virtual reality, right? Because all the categories, aspects are there. So what are the, uh, some basic categories important for virtual reality is that it is simulation, interactivity, artificial and immersion. Yes, yeah, so the characteristics of virtual reality. And when we start to think about 3D models, you are working with it, it is. Yeah? All aspects of virtual reality are in practice, right? I have to a little bit disagree right now because when you create a 3D model, for the example of the Pisa Tower, as you show, the virtual reality will never lie according that there's, you know, no yeah. straight tower, yeah. but it's a little bit moved. Yeah. But you show me great example how you can move the reality just with one shot of the photograph. Yeah. You can choose, you can change the perspective. The virtual reality and the visualization, it won't show you the real feel of the architecture or of the feature of the structure, but it could hardly lie in the shapes or in the some kind of morphological aspects. So I... Yeah, so something, it is form of representation of reality, but yeah. do not as, uh, aspire to the realism, yeah? Okay. Yeah, it depends right. what kind of realism you want. Uh, what we think about it, exactly. yeah? What we think about it, yes. It's our thinking and it is important. Now it is a problem to discuss it because we got a background. We got a sort of knowledge as a background. Mm -hmm. If we used to think about photography as objective representation, yeah, as a reality, so it's not easy to move to the way of thinking, okay, everything is a fiction, right? Archaeology is, okay, I will, f I will go very far now. Archaeology is creating a fiction, yeah? We create the past. We can't check the past. We do not have an access to the past. So we created the past, yeah? And we look for, let's say, we built a, a network of arguments showing that we are right and it's worth to pay us money for doing fiction, yeah? Okay, sorry, <laughs> I damaged archaeology now, but it's, it's my way of thinking. Okay, now if we are going into, let's say, the thinking these artifacts or models or visualizations are simulations, right? So we are in Jean Baudrillard concept, philosophical concept that the products, so it means 3D models, you produce on your classes the simulacra, yeah? And simulacra is not reality. It's not a past reality. Okay, so let's go back to this Sharkovsky quotation, but change the photograph into visual visualization. Just one word, okay? So visualization, visualization is, sorry, I lost it. Your lectures for next generation. That's why we do the records. <laughs> no, 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 really, I, I, I used to have a professor who used to talk to students, do not read his texts. So it was not, do not read his texts. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so this, this recording should be thrown away quickly. Okay? So visualization is a system of visual editing and we got a unlimited numbers of ways of visualizing the same set of data. Yeah? We got one set of data and absolutely 
billions of ways of visualizing them. And then we work and interpret the world based on those visualizations. So if we create, let's say, 100 and give people 100 different visualizations, we will have at least 1,000 different interpretations. OK? So if we go to, let's say, uh, the, this uh, graph showing the relations between photographer, spectator, text, and photography, so it was like this. Now we can add the simulacra as, a, as an element, which is, and, and let's say, if we introduce the simulacra, simulacra is also a text which should be read, right? So if we create a visualization, visualization is a text which should be read. And then, of course, we got a, someone who creates this visualization. I even don't want to think about those who created software or hardware allowing to do it. And the spectator, so it means the interpreter who is using it. So it's this, this let's say, process of building knowledge, if it is a knowledge, uh, it's much more complicated. Uh, so now we can ask the question if it is the way to use airborne uh, remote sensing methods to invest, investigate the past. Can we investigate the past using remote sensing methods? Okay, is it a question? Can we? Okay, you still believe that I yes, and Martin will tell I yes. Feel that you will ask the way a little bit to cancel all these, uh, these courses and so on and so on. Uh, okay, yes. about it. Think about yes. it. Yes. Okay, the, bit, so the, the second lecture is cancelled already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or at least you say to the students, please don't listen to them. <laughs> They, are, they don't know about it, but they are lying. <laughs> and, and they are um, so simple. <laughs> they don't know. This. I'm not joking. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So if we can create this kind of model of, uh, let's say, building knowledge about the past. So let's say we start with past. The past created, or people in the past created something which we can call data. Now, and then through methods, theories, interpretations, we got to the knowledge, knowledge about the past. Very, very general model. So in culture, historical archaeology, so let's say by Ludwig Flex, it's sort of style, yeah? or by uh, Thomas Kohn, it's sort of paradigm. Yeah? It is, the process is a very short one. Yeah? So the past created data, and from data straight, let's say straight from data, we go to the knowledge about the past. Of course, we can use methods, but, but definitely not theories yeah, and interpretations. So it means that when we take work with aerial photographs, it might be like this. And I don't know if, if you are taught like that, that let's say when you can see this kind of features, there are sunken houses. Right? Martin? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. Yes, I like it. Yes, yes, I do the same. I, I do the same. I do the same. OK? So if we interpret this kind of feature as a sunken house, or relics of sunken house, to be more precise, or traces of sunken house. So then we can create an image how it could look like in the past, right? OK, and we got some, let's say, studies and so on, and visualizations that it could look like this, right? So immediately when, let's say, at least when I fly and take a photograph, when I can see sunken houses, I can see the whole settlement yeah, in my mind, right? And you as students, when you work with photographs and you are already, let's say, 
prepared for the interpretation of earlier photographs, you can build this kind of knowledge about the past immediately, right? Yeah? Okay, fine. I will check, I will check it on the le next lecture if it is not cancelled. Okay? So, but it is, we are back in Greek philosophy. It is a mimetic uh, approach, yeah? That straight from data, we can go to the image of the past, okay? And we build our knowledge, so cognition through experience, through visual experience, mostly. Within aerial archeology, span it was, it was a normal practice within aerial archeology span and very, very late in, 20, in, in the 21st century, aerial archaeology started to discuss something, some theoretical aspects, uh, um, working with aerial, taking for aerial photographs and to interpretation of aerial photographs. So several books already appeared and they discussed, so not just me, okay? Not just me. <laughs> okay? But there is another aspect of visualizations, right? And, oh, Lenka is, <laughs> yeah, that visualization, so the simulacra we, which is prepared, okay, it's also, it got an also aesthetic aspect. And aesthetic aspect is very, very important. If you produce something ugly using strange colors, you will, got a bad, you will get bad mark from Lenka, right? If you create a very nice, attractive colors, it might be well marked. Okay. I, I already told them that they are, for LIDAR, there are exhibitions based just on the visualization, <laughs> not because of the features, but of the colors. Right. And I think it impressed a lot the students. Yeah. So if someone will go this way, not from the purpose to detect the features, but to show the aesthetic way, right. it will be nice. Yeah. But for the official market. Yeah, <laughs> and it is, it is <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, but it is important because we work not just for archaeologists, but also for the public. So aesthetic aspect is very, very important and it's very persuasive element, right? So, and aesthetics is something scientific? Not, yeah? It's out of, yeah? So, <clears throat> when we are focusing on aesthetics, we can something create something which is, let's say, far away from reality, if we know what, is, what reality is, okay? But also we can introduce some other elements that visualization is a form of narration, it is form of persuas persuasion, it's a form of power, yeah? And it's, it's aspect of standardization is, okay? And it is important the standardization is very important because it is, let's say, it is necessary to standardize the work, but because then we can compare each other, yeah, using this kind of standards. But on the other hand, any standardization is a reducing information, it right? Us. Yeah, and there is no, 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 no golden, golden, I don't know, Golden in the middle, some golden in the middle. I don't know how it's, uh, it might be in Czech, yeah? So it is always a problem and we th should think about what is important now at this moment for this task. It is just that we can reduce some information because of the needs of standardization or we want to do something unique. We understand that standardization is not useful at this moment. Right? But it, is, it should be clearly expressed. It should be clearly expressed. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Again, uh, we can return to, to Martin Heidegger and his, his philosophy. So if we, especially what is important, that if we follow 
the schemes which were already created and let's say accepted thought style, for example, by Ludwig Fleck, then we are starting to talk about something which is called idle, idle talk. Idle talk, I don't know if you can understand this, uh, uh, this phrase, idle talk. It is just repeating the same without thinking, without deeper thinking. Okay? So, uh, uh, for Heidegger, uh, if we want to be uh, researchers, we always should be critical and do not accept what others presented. Always we should be critical and looking for why, or asking why those person decided to do something in that way or other way. Yeah? So then it is a, let's say, be a consciously uh, um, active researcher, right? If you repeat what was already told, uh, it is just an idle talk. Uh, now we are, wow, we should, <laughs> okay, 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 ten minutes. <laughs> Time, okay. So now, <clears throat> I, can, I can believe that especially Martin will be uh, upset. <laughs> no? Uh, <laughs> okay, so. But I have to finish somehow because right now, in the middle point of your presentation, it's no way that you should end. I still expect that so there will be some more positive. <laughs> there is nothing positive, okay. <laughs> okay, so according, according, uh, according to Heidegger, scientists are thoughtless if they are just focused on technology, okay? If they just focus exclusively on technology, it will be just idle talk, empty writing or empty clicking. Yes, just clicking by clicking because you have to follow the same of way of clicking, yeah? Okay? You should, you should involve let's say, some aspect of thinking and the purpose, the aim or the critical aspect of data, uh, approach to data and so on. I, I f really like this quotation, yeah? We live in the world where there is more and more information, do you agree? And less and less meaning. So there's less meaning in the, behind this information. So now there is an uh, um, let's say finishing this lecture. Okay, finishing the, it is probably the last or one of the last slide. It is a uh, question addressed to you after this lecture. Do the modern technologies allow us to get knowledge on the past societies? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. I thought. That's where, I mean, where would archaeology be today if it didn't uh, invent or uh, work on modern technologies? Uh, it's okay, I, from my point of view, of course, we are not responsible for inventing technologies, but we should understand this technology. It is important. We should understand the, the technology. Then we can, we can know how to use this technology and for what purpose we should and use it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, my, if you ask, if you tell, yes, we can get the knowledge about the past society, it's uh, dramatic. Okay, so from my point of view, we got now, we are a situation now that we got a lot of new technologies, but we still, as archeologists, got the same questions, traditional questions, questions which appeared in 19th century, in archaeology, and we still use this traditional language. We still use the term cultural, uh, uh, archaeological culture or archaeological site or so. They are very, very traditional terms which are used in archaeology. So, 
my uh, answer is think first and then apply technology. Thank you very much. Any questions? A lot of. <laughs> Yeah, but fortunately we discussed during the lectures, so it was not just that. I have to say that I'm very happy that you did to introduce to the students this topic, because you are totally right that we are trying to teach them what we already know, but actually not. We believe we know. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, when I ask you, it's better to show the students the basic of the interpretation of the line of teachers, or not? leave them their expression for the first look, for the first sight, without they know that <coughs> this feature is the ancient road or whatever. I don't know what is better. I think something in the, bit, in the middle. There is they no have to yeah. know the basics. They have yeah. to know right. everything that is already said and standardized. I hate this word as well, and I hate to be like that. Um, because that's the base ground for them. But after, um, I'm really impressed how the students, many times they came to me and they asked me, what could this feature be look like? I saw it for the first time, I'm lost. Of course I'm lost. Sure, yeah. But I like it. it I it, like it, those moments. Yes, yes, uh, yes. It, it is what I mentioned with this mm -hmm. uh, uh, first world, uh, world uh, yeah. prison, yeah? Yeah, yeah? I learned something from my PhD student, mm -hmm. yeah? And now my knowledge is a bit bigger. But it's based yeah. on the technology. Yeah. Without sure. the technology, you won't yeah. know it. And it is not a shame to, to, to don't know. Yeah? It's not a shame to, 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 to not, not present uh, ourselves that we know everything. It's quite frequent. But also what I try when I, when I teach students interpretation of early photographs, I allow them to talk about everything. What they, what they can see, and then asking the question why, why they think it is like this, or it is that, or something like that. And then try them to, to look for other possible interpretations, yes? Just to not go straight to the interpretation. When we are, let's say, Professor Goida and myself, when we look at photograph, it's just like this, yeah? Or when it is necessary to, let's say, mm, have this kind of knowledge and skills when you fly, and you have a, just a second to make a decision about taking photograph or not, yeah? And it is a process of interpretation, right? So it is, uh, but we should be aware that the process like this exists, and this process got an impact on the final interpretation. And I will do, if you come for the next lecture, and uh, there will be a bit more about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's time time for break. Sorry for. So. But definitely, looking at our reaction of the students, we definitely were fancy it, and we were very pleased uh, that uh, we were had the possibility to discuss and to, to, to listen to your other questions. I think I would say one point is that. Obviously, I, I, I think it's, it's quite a long-term uh, suggestion that, that, that the history, writing history and archaeology, it is writing about how we see that it is the question of interpretation which again is based on the background of the, the one who is making the interpretation. So I always say, for instance, if you, if you place some database in a photograph or a photograph and you, you, you write, you can see that this and this and this, that should be your name because you are an interpreter because there will come in a month or in a year or in, in, in 10 years someone else who said, well, but I think this is not, this is not something now, this is, this is maybe something modern uh, thing of, of agriculture product or something like that, you know. So all of the interpretation is really personal way, by personal way, how to see, how to learn and how to read the photograph as a text. But you have to say, this is my interpretation. This is not objective interpretation. This is my interpretation. Is that right? Do you right. Agree? Yes, oh, surely. <laughs> Thank you. At least someone understood my lecture. Yes. Okay, so I hope that we will see all, all of us will see in uh, half past one here again, and we will continue in this, in this interesting. Okay, thank you very much.